Good evening from my side and uh, Mr. Prime Minister, good evening. Great to have you here to welcome you in Berlin and Mr. Merz, as Mr. Lambert said already, the chairman of the CDU in Germany. Good evening. So um, maybe we start with uh, our guest, the Prime Minister. We have heard many warm words about your governance and uh, Greece. So maybe one can say you are not there today from zero to hero, but you're on your way from political wise. So it's only three weeks ago that your country returned to investment grade, three weeks about, I think, but it took you 13 years and you are in power since 2019. So what's your part of this comeback of this success story? Well, first, uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, for um, uh, hosting us, uh, and thank you, uh, Friedrich, for uh, agreeing to this uh, conversation. Uh, I was looking at this uh, splendid uh, photo uh, of the uh, Acropolis, you know, all very nice and very, very sunny. And uh, as I was coming in, I, I remembered, uh, you know, a cover of the Economist magazine uh, during the years of the financial crisis with the helicopters flying over the Acropolis uh, and with a very sort of ominous uh, title, Acropolis Now, making a reference to the Apocalypse Now uh, movie of, uh, of the 70s. And I was thinking, yes, indeed, uh, we have made a lot of progress since these days. And it was not that far ago, back in 2015, where Greece essentially found itself uh, on the precipice of a massive uh, catastrophe. We managed to avoid it at the time because the populist government realized uh, the consequences of leading Greece down that path. But even when we came into power in 2019, we knew that we had a lot of work to do in order to restore Greece's credibility. And our first goal was always to restore the soundness of our public um, finances uh, and to achieve uh, growth rates which would be significantly higher than the rest of the European Union, uh, to follow a prudent fiscal policy, but also to drive growth-friendly measures that will make Greece an attractive investment destination. And I think four years later, it is probably fair to say that uh, this policy has been uh, uh, overall a success. The economy is growing faster, significantly faster than the Eurozone. Average, uh, our debt to GDP is declining uh, at the rate which uh, even we could not have anticipated a few years uh, ago. Uh, we've brought down unemployment significantly. The country has been able to attract record foreign direct investment over the past um, uh, three years. Uh, uh, and uh, we managed, as you pointed out, to regain uh, investment uh, grade uh, over the past. Uh, weeks, which of course for us was a, a big achievement uh, and uh, marks uh, probably the end of a very painful uh, cycle uh, which lasted for more than a decade. So now that I think a, a, you know, a significant part of the difficult job of bringing Greece back to normality has been achieved, you know, the next goal uh, is how do we bring Greece closer to Europe, if I were just to put uh, you know, a one-sentence title to what has happened over the past 10 years. We tried and succeeded in keeping Greece within Europe, and now we need to make sure that Greece actually converges uh, with Europe and we make up for a lost decade. We should not forget that Greece lost 25%, 25% of its GDP during the difficult years uh, of the crisis. So uh, let me stop here in terms of my uh, introductory remarks by, by saying to you that the Greece you remembered during the fiscal crisis is not the Greece uh, that uh, 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 exists today. Uh, and I think this overall uh, transformation also uh, is a tribute to the resilience of the Greek people. It's not just the government, it's society that has been able to hold together during very difficult years. And of course, uh, an electorate which voted us back into power with an increased share of the vote because I think they recognized very rationally that basically we've done a good job and they believed in what we will do for the next four years in our program. Listening to that, Mr. Meritz, what's your evaluation from your, from the German perspective about this yeah, successful journey as we just listened to it? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that 
it was a really a great success, not just for Greece and for the Christian Democrats and for Kyriakos himself, but it was a great success for Europe that uh, your party, Kyriakos, won the election in uh, June this year. And by the way, this was a better result you achieved five years ago. And this only happened uh, more than 50 years ago uh, for the first time in Greece that a prime minister was re-elected by such a great result uh, for his second term. This is so, this is really a, an amazing, a great success. Personal for you, but also for your country. And let me say that there is a second result with made um, the same pleasure for all of us was the success of Donald Tusk in uh, Poland uh, uh, three uh, weeks ago. This is again, not just for the Christian Democrats, but this is for Poland, um, a great event and a great success that he has won the elections and that he will form the future government in uh, Poland. Having said that, um, I have to confess that I had some doubts about what the European Union and what we in Germany did and decided on Greece um, 10 years ago. And you had a prime minister in your country which made it, who made it extremely complicated for us to agree on what we did uh, in terms of restructuring and to bring Greece back on track for a stable economy. But you achieved it and respect for that. And Greece is now an extremely interesting country for investment. And Greece is playing a very strong role in the European Union. And uh, with you in person, Kyriakos, uh, uh, your country is again a, a, a strong pillar for the European Union and for the future political and economic uh, development of the European Union. And please allow to say that um, we are really dependent on strong member states in the European Union because we are actually faced with some very, very strong challenges around the world. And the one is the Ukraine war. And the second event is uh, this terrible terrorist attacks in Israel. So the European Union now has to stick together more than ever and on the horizon, we are seeing the likelihood that Donald Trump might be back in the Oval Office in one year's time from now, when we will meet next year at this time, the elections in the United States, the presidential elections and the Congress elections will have already taken place. So let's be prepared for hard times. And in hard times, you need strong partners. And Greece is now again one of the strongest partners for the European Union and for our country as well. So many thanks for that great achievement. Just uh, one question on that, what you just said. You said you had some doubts back in time. And uh, when we think about 2010, the debate about a Grexit was real. I mean, today that sounds uh, quite strange and maybe not it's uh, in front of us, but your party, the CDU, had a discussion about right. Mr. Schäuble who said a temporary Grexit would be the right way and Angela Merkel who was against her own finance minister back in time. So which side would you focus on? Where is the yeah, the lesson learned today from both sides. Well, um, as you know, I left Parliament in 2009, and I had a period of normal life between. And um, in 2010, I only observed these uh, events from the outside. But uh, from my professional uh, perspective, I would have then supported those who said it could be better to let them out for a certain period of time and to bring them back to the European Union again after a certain period of time. But I have to say, from today's perspective, this would have been the wrong decision. It was right how Angela Merkel decided, but uh, it was a big amount of uncertainties behind that. And I think that all of the participants, even those who were directly affected by the decisions, were not sure 
whether this would be the right way or not. From today's perspective, it was the right decision. Congratulations to all of those who took it. And focusing on the fiscal EU policy and also the growth and stability pact, would you, how would you describe your claim today? Would you say, based on your example and your way you came along, that joint debt should be the model or the version of the European Union, maybe in exchange for more regulations? Or what's your claim after the chapter or the way Greece took? Well, that is a, a complicated question. But uh, first of all, uh, and a sensitive one, uh, I recognize, especially when I speak in, uh, uh, in Germany. But um, let me first uh, start by agreeing with what Friedrich said, uh, in order to be able to maintain a monetary union without a, you know, a clear central fiscal capacity, one needs fiscal discipline in the member states. Of course, one also needs to make sure that we avoid mistakes of the past, because I think the biggest mistake that was made during the years of the Greek fiscal crisis was to push for probably more uh, austerity, draconian measures, which uh, essentially created a death trap uh, of, a, of, a, of a depression that further brought down uh, revenues and made uh, fiscal targets uh, unattainable. So I think that when you look at the future of the Stability and Growth Pact, which is, as you know, currently being negotiated, the initial approach of the Commission uh, more flexibility in exchange for reforms uh, and uh, ownership in terms of the medium-term fiscal policies by the member states is the right one. And I understand that there is progress has been made by our finance ministers uh, over the past uh, weeks, and I would expect us to agree the new rules, and I think we need to agree the new, uh, to the new rules before the end of the uh, year. Uh, these rules are important, but of course uh, there is a, a f you know, a another outside uh, arbiter of our fiscal performance, and that's the markets. Uh, and when you look at, for example, uh, Greek debt now, uh, it is trading close to the levels, level of Spain's debt. Uh, and uh, our 10-year bond is significantly below that of Italy's. Who would have thought that this would have been possible uh, four uh, years ago? So as much as I believe uh, in the fiscal rules uh, uh, imposed by the Commission, one should not uh, forget that the markets are constantly looking at us, and especially for those countries that have a high debt, uh, they will keep us honest in terms of us being able to produce primary uh, surpluses and have a clear path towards reducing our debt. But these primary surpluses, in our case, need to be produced through a growth-friendly policy and not by overtaxing the Greek people and the Greek business sector. What we have achieved, which I think is, uh, is uh, a key component of our success, was to create growth by reasonably reducing taxes, uh, but also going after tax evasion. Uh, and the second term of, of my government will focus much more on tackling uh, tax evasion than, uh, uh, than bringing down, uh, further bringing down um, uh, tax rates, which I think uh, are probably going to stay where they are for quite some period of time. In, if we bring down tax evasion, then we can start also bringing down VAT and, uh, and indirect taxes, which would be my goal towards the end uh, of my second mandate. Now, to your question regarding um, uh, the ability, the capacity of the European Union uh, to issue debt jointly, this is what we did uh, for the Next Generation EU program. And I think it was an important milestone. And it was very important that Germany and Angela Merkel at the time agreed um, uh, to what was, in, in my mind, a a very important decision taken by the European Council that gives Greece almost 36 billion euros of grants uh, and, and debt to finance the green and digital transition. If we make that a success, then we can talk about possibly repeating what we did in the future. But I don't want to open this discussion before the timing is appropriate. The Next Generation EU program has a lot of conditionality attached to it. It's a difficult and complicated program to execute. And we know that the bar is high. 
and we know that we have to push our bureaucracy to make sure that we're consistent with, with what was um, um, uh, what has been asked uh, uh, of us to do, because at the end of the day, you know, we're borrowing as a union and we're giving the poorer countries money to spend. So I understand that the threshold is high. If we make this a success, then maybe in three, four years, we can have uh, this uh, discussion again. But my focus right now is to ensure maximum absorption capacity of the significant European funds that we have at our disposal. So you just heard, um, it's a good example, it's a successful way, but Greece is still heavily in debt. So listen to that and knowing that um, there were public investors, it's a long-term loan, it's a low interest rate. Would you agree on what uh, the Prime Minister just said and say, this is a representative case for EU policy? Well, um, this is at least for some of the European member states uh, representative, it's not for all. We are having different views, different approaches, different uh, situations in different member states in the European Union. The northern part of the European Union is seeing that differently. Um, the western part of the European Union, our country, is that seeing partly differently. Um, I would like to um, point out one number, and that is for me, really a concern. The public indebtedness overall in the world is actually beyond 300 trillion dollars. In German, 300 billionen, not, not, just, just to make the difference. Um, and this, this is something which is really threatening the capital markets, and you always have to find people who are still willing to refinance this public debt. And this is only the public side. You are having private indebtedness, which is all-time high. You are having corporate indebtedness, which is all-time high. So we have to take into account that capital markets are not willing to finance indebtedness overall and for, for all times. And now interest rates have coming up again. Uh, I, th I think that the Federal Reserve in, in New York did it a little bit better than the ECB. We are in Europe still behind the curve. And that is the reason why we are still having the perspective of more or less high interest rates for the next upcoming years. And so we have to take into account this numbers. For the, for I give you an, another number for the for the federal budget in our country. Here we will have the uh, debate for our 2024 uh, budget uh, in two in two weeks from now. We had four billion interest rates to pay on our federal budget. We have to pay 40 billion euros to pay just to pay our public debts on the federal level. So please let's be careful on further indebtedness for public uh, household, for public budgets. This is not without danger. I, I, I don't want to foresee or predict a future financial crisis, but these numbers in general are too high and we have to do anything what we can do, reasonable, looking at different situations in different countries in the European Union, but we have to take into account that these numbers are too high and that these numbers could create another financial crisis and this would be the end of our welfare state if we are, if we are faced with this uh, uh, risk. So if I'm not mistaken, there is a bit more carefulness in your words than I just heard between your lines, but next year there is the uh, European election coming up, 2024, and um, you are both in the family of the party EPP, so finding common ground in that question, how to deal with the fiscal policy in Europe, what's your, your common ground in that? I mean, uh, facing the uh, right wing and uh, the growth at that time, you have to have uh, 
is the situation where you give common as the same answers or address problems in the same way from the same position, don't you? Well, again, coming from a country that is just exiting a very traumatic period in our modern history, my one commitment to the Greek people is that we will never ever go through what, uh, what happened to Greece starting in 2010. So fiscal discipline cannot be challenged. Uh, and that is non-negotiable uh, for me. And I know that it is also the basis, the foundation for a growth-friendly policy. Because when I come here to Germany, and explain to, Gre to German businesses why there are significant investment opportunities in Greece at a time when German industry is facing challenges in its competitiveness and maybe the German Mittelstand is looking for places within Europe to invest. The first thing that the German businesses will ask me, is it safe? Is the right country risk? Uh, have you left uh, the difficult years behind us for good? And that is why uh, fiscal discipline and uh, healthy but sustainable primary surpluses are non-negotiable uh, for us. Having said that, we need to recognize that as Europe, we are facing serious competitiveness issues. How will we address a United States which is becoming more protectionist and which is spending a lot of money um, to support its domestic industry and which seems to run a very high deficit without the capital markets being too concerned about it, at least for the moment. On the other hand, you have China with its, with its own model of state capitalism, and you have Europe in the middle that needs to invest and can do so either by mobilizing European money or by mobilizing national funds. But you cannot allow countries such as Germany, allow, I mean, uh, within, the Euro within the single market, to make excessive use of, uh, uh, of uh, state aid exemptions because at the end of the day you will create an uneven playing field because we cannot do that because of our fiscal rules. Germany can, but then the German industry is going to become more competitive uh, than uh, you know the Greek industry or the uh, Italian industry. So preserving the cohesion of the single market, strengthening the single market, resolving issues around the competitiveness of uh, the European business environment should be a major priority for the EPP for the next four years. This is very, very important. Uh, if you look at, for example, our digital competitiveness and you talk to startuppers, for example, in Greece, we have a very vibrant uh, startup ecosystem and they will tell you that uh, we talk a lot about the European single market, but it doesn't really exist when it comes to digital services. We've made a lot of steps We've taken steps in that direction, but these steps need to be completed. So I would urge us, thinking about the agenda after the European elections, to do focus on these issues of competitiveness, because they are uh, absolutely critical for Europe um, uh, as a whole. Energy. You know, we are faced with significant challenges. How do we drive renewable energy, which can be cheaper uh, and also needs to be more uh, reliable? It's critical. When you look at, for example, the energy production pattern from renewables, you will realize that the north of Europe produces a lot of wind energy in the winter, and we produce a lot of solar energy in the summer. Do we have the north to south interconnections to make this market work more effectively for both the north and the south? The answer is no, not yet. So how do we structurally address the issue of energy uh, competitiveness without resorting to short-term subsidies which are not going to do uh, the trick. What is, for example, the future? You've taken a decision vis-a-vis -vis nuclear, uh, and it is uh, right, wrong, it's up to you to, uh, to decide, but uh, at the end of the day, will we, for example, as Europe, invest uh, in new nuclear technology? We have zero interest in this because we're not a country that has any sort of nuclear uh, heritage. But uh, where are we going to place our chips uh, as Europe in this global uh, sort of competitiveness uh, uh, market? What are the new technologies? Are we simply going to try to produce um, uh, solar panels uh, or wind farms cheaper than the Chinese? Uh, that, that, may be, that may be a struggle um, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, apart from the economic situation, I would like to add another topic. Um, 
Poly crisis seems to be the new normal, and uh, the Western democracies are heavily challenged these days. And one topic that is very dominant to the public opinion and very important is migration. So just maybe you could give us an wrap up. What's the current situation in Greece? How is the, how are the numbers and how Difficult is it also to deal with this we see public opinion towards this topic? No discussion in Germany these days is complete without a reference to migration, I understand. That was actually the case in Greece back in 2019. It is no longer the case, and I'll tell you why. When we came into power in 2019, uh, we inherited a catastrophic situation when it came to migration. Essentially an open-door policy and an inability by the Greek government to quickly process asylum applications. So we had both a stock and a flow problem. We had a lot of people in Greece, most of them on our islands, and we kept bringing in more people. We didn't know what to do with them. Um, so we decided that we needed a dramatic rethink of our migration policy. What did we do? We became much uh, stricter in terms of managing our borders. Uh, always uh, in line with international law, but we didn't make it easy for people to come into Greece. I was very open uh, and outspoken from the beginning. Our Coast Guard is not you know, a welcoming um, uh, sort of service uh, to encourage people to come uh, into Greece, and the same is true for our um, uh, land border uh, agencies. I remind you, in 2020, we were faced with an open attempt by Turkey to instrumentalize migrants and send them across the border into Europe, and we managed to defend the Greek border and the European border uh, successfully. So where are we now? Uh, we are at the state where we can manage the flows, uh, and we've also addressed the issues of processing asylum claims much more effectively. Yes, uh, I'm very honest, there are still you know, secondary movements, especially for those who actually receive uh, a positive asylum decision. A lot of this has to do with the reforms that you have to undertake in Germany, because if Germany, at the end of the day, is so attractive as a destination for migrants, it is very, very difficult um, to manage the external border if you have a huge magnet uh, in, in Germany that is so strong that it overcomes uh, all our efforts to manage the external border. At the same time, we've made it clear that we need legal pathways to migration and we need partnerships with countries with whom we can cooperate and we need a more effective return policy. Pieces seem to fall into place also at the level of the European Council because there is a better understanding that we cannot have an effective migration policy without managing the external border. So what we're doing, you know, other countries are trying uh, to do, we need more help, we need more money. We will be discussing uh, the revision of the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework. Uh, and I'm very clear and outspoken uh, here. There, we cannot just agree to 50 billion for Ukraine. Um, we need to also add to the table more money for migration, more money to work with partner countries. You may ask me afterwards about our situation and our relationship with Turkey, but we need to work with Turkey when it comes to migration. And this also involves some um, a continuation of the financial payments to Turkey because they do manage a large number uh, of uh, uh, migrants. Uh, uh, and uh, overall, I'm slightly more optimistic than I was two years ago that at least we have a better understanding at the level of the European Council of how complicated the situation is and how important it is to make sure that uh, you address the, uh, the external aspects uh, of, of migration much more effectively. Do you agree on that, saying Greece has shouldered everything they can so far and uh, the problem is a strong magnet in Germany? Or would you say there are certain things also due to law that Greece has to do more homework here? May I give one additional comment on the economic side of our debate? Um, for the European Union, next year we will have the... Uh, election for the European Parliament, I think that we should also focus on our um, um, competition uh, um, legislation in the European Union. Uh, I'm saying that because I'm, I'm not just uh, concerned about uh, state aids, but our legal framework for cooperation and for mergers 
and merger control in the European Union is, in my view, not at that level where it should be, because we are not having these European um, companies which are really globally competitive. And that is something we are. We are. We we, we talked about that uh, earlier. I think we have we, we have to improve not the demand side of our economies, but the competition side. And that is something which we really agree on within the European People's Party. And that is something which makes me extremely optimistic that we will come to a good program for the next uh, EP elections. And this, uh, this is decisive for the next term of the for the um, EU Commission. So having said that, um, back to the uh, migration issue. You know that we had a very strong debate here in this country for weeks and months now. The prime ministers of the states and the chancellor came to an agreement last Monday or last Tuesday night. Um, in my view, this is something which goes into the right direction, but this is far behind the necessary decisions which have to be taken nationally. Uh, Kuriakos mentioned the European uh, framework, which is extremely important. Um, I think we have to do more on the, um, on the border protection within the European uh, Union to strengthen Frontex. Um, I agree with all who are saying we need more money for that. Um, I'm trying to convince uh, Ursula von der Leyen that she is giving up her reluctance on that. Um, if we want to protect the European Union, we have to protect our borders. Uh, Greece is doing something which is good for Greece, um, but to be honest, we are faced with some problems here in this country because our courts do not allow to return people to Greece because, because of the standards you are having in your camps in terms of humanitarian standards. So this is something which is really affecting us and this is something which is uh, creating some problems here. Next and last point, um, migration will be an issue for years and integration will be an issue for even longer time. Uh, if you are looking at what is happening in Germany actually, what we are seeing here in this country uh, in terms of uh, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic uh, demonstrations and uh, escalations on our streets, this is completely unacceptable for our country and ha we have to do much more domestically. We cannot rely just on the European level. European, European level has to do a lot on that, but most of the work has to be done domestically here in this country. And my personal guess is that we are still far behind what is really necessary to come to a better solution on these issues. Actually, I know that we have to wrap it up and you need to see Mr. Scholz, but one last point I would like to know from you is um, President Erdogan is arriving or expected on next Friday here in Berlin. You will meet him in December as well. And Germany and Greece, both countries, want a new deal with the EU and Turkey. Given the fact what uh, Friedrich Merz just said and to know that um, Erdogan just called the Hamas freedom fighters. So what is the way or what's the direction to have Turkey with President Erdogan as a partner and what's the price for a deal you would pay? Will you talk with him about that tonight? Mm. <laughs> I may talk to him about that tomorrow. Tonight we have a, okay, so an, interesting, an, an interesting meeting um, with other heads of state and government uh, with um, uh, President Michel to discuss you know, issues related to the future of Europe. Let me just um, quickly take you back to 2019 when again we came into power. We had to deal at the time with a very aggressive uh, Turkey, both on the migration front, again, remember what happened in March 2020, but also in terms of our bilateral uh, issues, there was a constant revisionism and an attempt to encroach uh, upon Greece's um, uh, sovereign rights, especially when it came to activities at sea. Uh, eventually, I think we were able to convince Turkey that this was a counterproductive 
uh, approach. And over the past months, we have seen a significant detente in terms of our relationships. I've met President Erdogan twice. That was before um, uh, the recent uh, flare-up in the Middle East. Uh, and we've agreed on a path towards normalizing our relationships. We will meet again in Greece uh, in uh, December. Uh, with uh, the aim to set you know, a positive agenda and not let our long-standing um, differences escalate to a point where we risk a military conflict. Mm -hmm. So manage our difficulties uh, and build upon a positive um, uh, agenda. This is the approach uh, I've taken. Now, of course, I completely disagree uh, with uh, uh, the comments uh, of President Erdogan regarding Hamas, and I don't think I'm the only European leader uh, who, will, uh, who will say that. Uh, at the same point, this is no reason not to welcome uh, President Erdogan uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Greece. We will talk about our bilateral relationship. We will talk about our relationship between um, um, uh, Turkey and Europe, which again is very clearly defined by decisions taken uh, at the European uh, Council. And I always try to be um, a constructive uh, and solve problems rather than, than add uh, uh, more uh, difficulties. So uh, my principle has always been, it is always better to talk to all parties involved. And at the end of the day, in spite of what President Erdogan said about, uh, about Hamas, I think we all have an interest in making sure that this conflict does not escalate beyond the horrible situation we currently, we already have to address. And I'm sure that Turkey also has the same uh, interest. No one wants to see a further uh, escalation uh, of, um, uh, of the conflict. So. In my mind, uh, no one is ever losing um, when they engage and when they talk, even when they have to have difficult discussions and difficult conversations. Do you agree on that? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And I said that already last week, that it's uh, obvious that a meeting between our German Chancellor and the President of Turkey makes sense. Uh, it would make no sense to... Um, to uh, ask him not to come to Germany. Uh, this is the right time to speak. And uh, I have to say that I'm really uh, um, admiring what the Greece government is uh, doing with uh, this neighbor. This is a very complicated neighborhood in this uh, region of the world. They are both members of NATO. And so this is the most critical part of the NATO territory uh, in the world, so that these two leaders from Turkey and from Greece are meeting and speaking to each other is extremely necessary and important. So I fully underscore what uh, Koyakas just said on his bilateral relationship to Turkey. It's a little bit more complicated or different, not compl more complicated, it couldn't be more complicated, but it, it's a little bit different here in this country. Uh, but we are having a common interest and that is the um, consistence and the um, uh, existence of the EU-Turkey agreement on refugees. This uh, had been uh, negotiated uh, with Angela Merkel uh, years ago. It uh, had resolved some of the problems and uh, Turkey is still having roughly two million refugees out of Syria on his territory. So this is something which is a real threat for the country and this could be and become a threat for all of us. So we are having interest in having good relationship to this complicated country and to this uh, 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 president. And uh, by the way, uh, I share that uh, um, view and that's that estimate that uh, Erdogan is not having interest in an escalation of the conflict because he is faced with some domestic challenges in his own country. Inflation rate is extremely high. The economy is suffering. Uh, people are unemployed. So he is somebody who is who might be and should be interested in having uh, uh, some. Uh, well, how should I say, some pressure on the, on the Hamas not to escalate and pressure on Iran not to escalate this conflict. He would suffer from an escalation uh, more than others uh, within uh, uh, Europe and within uh, NATO. So this is something which we, we should really estimate correctly. And so it, 
it makes always sense to speak. And in this special situation we are faced with, no doubt about that. I would like to continue. So if you could postpone your meeting tonight, you might stay. Oh, we still have five, okay. ten minutes if you want to. No, I already saw some people giving me a sign that it's time to come to an end. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Millets. Thanks for having us all here tonight and for your time and your visit. And uh, good luck with your trip here in Germany and afterwards. And, and good well. luck to and good luck to both of us for the European. Elections. There's always another election around the corner. <laughs>